as some of you know, I am not Tim Madama. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but he's here. <laughs> but I am the one who twisted his arm until I persuaded him he had to come. And I want to tell you why I twisted his arm. Number one, he was my boss for about 25 years, and you can't imagine how good it feels to twist your boss. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Tim taught here for about 30 years, and I was lucky enough to have a front row seat into the incredible things he did while he was here. Like becoming a TV star and waking up a bunch of grumpy, sleepy teenagers who hated history and ended up becoming history majors. Like training, like exposing a whole generation of students to music, mm -hmm. the likes of which they had never ever heard before and came to love. <coughs> like transforming all kinds of kids into gourmet cooks so they could see if they could cook the best dish at the luncheon that we had every year as part of Tim's Southern Culture course, which, by the way, was the most popular course ever taught at Beaufort County Community College. But what Tim did the best in his transformative way with his warmth and his wit was to transform our students toward an attitude an attitude of openness to the world out there and to the people all around. Now he has shifted his focus from the social sciences to the natural sciences, turning his wide-eyed, unswerving gaze into the woods around his home and playing hide and seek with his readers. I think we could all call ourselves students still. Playing hide and seek with our own sense of wonder, as he did with his students. So it's with great joy that I give you our very own Mr. Manimo. <laughs> Thanks, Jude. <laughs> Notice I had to kind of wade up here. <laughs> Anyhow, greetings from the woods of Chatham County, which is where I now live. Uh, I retired two and a half years ago, and we moved to Pittsburgh to be with our children and our grandchildren, and freedom. <laughs> if I had to say in one word what retirement is like, that would be the word. This is just wonderful. I mean, so many people that were students uh, that I worked with, that I loved, This is just great. Thank you for coming. And, hey Trish, don't sneak in here. And, and I, I will try not to bore you too much. Okay? Uh, if, if you read Bill Rumley, Rumley's article in the Washington Daily News, which was wonderful, uh, far better than I deserve or expected, uh, you know that I have been writing poetry pretty steadily for about 60 years, but I kept it quiet, kept it on the down low, uh, for a variety of reasons, but probably the most important reason is that it, for me, was always personal. Uh, I wrote about my family and 
the people that I knew and I loved and the world around me and I was never interested in publishing anything. I was a newspaper reporter for about 10 years and I quickly got over seeing my name in print. First time I got a byline, I rushed into my editor's office to thank him <coughs> and he looked up at me. He wore a flat top and chewed unlit cigars. And he looked up at me and he said, yeah, well, now they'll know who to blame. <laughs> uh, which they did on a few occasions. <laughs> so I, I just decided, you know, keep it to myself. Stuff accumulated. And then about three years ago, I got into this thing of writing haiku, which I had been writing off and on throughout most of this period. I wrote my first one when I was 18. And I accumulated, uh, I don't know, three or four hundred of them. And I decided that it would be a neat thing for my family and some close friends to publish a book. Uh, and I had set some money aside for some frivolous purpose, and that was to be it. And then I made the mistake of letting Penny and Judith know, and they sort of took over my life. Okay? So that's why I am here today. Uh, the reading is going to be basically in two parts. Uh, I am going to read some selections from the book Calligraphy on the Moon's Face. Did I say calligraphy on the moon's face? Ah. As it happens, as the box would suggest, uh, I have several copies with me. And when it's over, we are going to sell these, and the proceeds are going to go to the Friends of Goose Creek State Park in memory of Dan Meyer. Okay? So they're 10 bucks, and don't worry, the doors are locked, so there's no escape. <laughs> um, anyhow, it would be a lovely memorial to Dan who loved Goose Creek State Park and the Pamlico River and the Rocky Mountains. We couldn't find the foundation for the Rocky Mountains, so we're going to go with Goose Creek. Uh, in addition to the selections from calligraphy, I am going to read a few other poems uh, of a different time, kind, different style, which basically for your purposes means they're longer and they're more narrative. Uh, and most of them are pretty recent. I, I decided to not go way back in time uh, with one exception, okay? and we'll get to that. But let me tell you first, how many people here know what haiku is? Really, you can be honest. Okay, better do it then. Uh, haiku is a traditional Japanese <coughs> poetic form, and it is characterized by brevity and the ability to evoke a response in the reader. When I say brevity, three lines, of five, seven, and five syllables. That's pretty tight. Okay, you got to get what you have to say said uh, in not a lot of space. Um, dates back to the 17th century, and it is now practiced throughout the world, including in America. Now, American haiku poets don't normally adhere to the 575 schema because Japanese and English are very, very different structurally and syllables don't mean the same thing and they're not used the same way. Okay? But they do stick to the brevity, usually the three lines, and the power, hopefully, when they are successful, to suggest, to evoke a response in the reader. Uh, the first, I think I've got a copy of it somewhere here, the first haiku that we think was written in English was written over a hundred years ago by Ezra Pound. And it's 
the apparition of these faces in the crowd. Pebbles on a wet black bow. That's it. And since then, it has caught on. There are thousands of haiku poets writing in English. There are dozens of journals. Uh, it is published in some of the bigger general poetry journals. Uh, and that in part is why I'm here, because Calligraphy on the Moon's Face is a collection of 100 haiku. I arranged the book according to the seasons. And so I'll start off with the first season, which in Japan is spring. Okay? The new year is the beginning of spring, not January 1st, which is just weird. <laughs> that old sandal had a frog inside. I almost put it on. Under branches thick with blossoms. The loud buzz of bees. That actually happened. There, there is a small grove of Japanese cherry trees on the ECU campus. And we lived about uh, half a block from the campus. And one morning, Karen and I <clears throat> were walking underneath them at blossom time. And it was like we'd walked into a beehive. And we looked up, and there were thousands upon thousands mm. of bees. And I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> Silent buzzards tilt on rising air. Warm spring afternoon. Now, somebody who knows about these things informed me that turkey vultures tilt and black buzzards soar. Or maybe it's the other way around. Because when they're 150 feet up in the air, you really can't tell the difference. <laughs> and my guys were killed. That means they're going. Turkey. Turkey, see? <laughs> see? She revealed herself. <laughs> A new snake skin in the shed. No sign of mice. <laughs> At first light, a thin crescent moon above high pines. Bluebirds on a fence, watching their young become bluebirds. Under light sleep, a dream dissolves. Sound of rain. We have a metal roof on our house. When it rains, you know it. Cutting clover, I leave some blossoms near the fence. High black branch, calligraphy on the moon's face. Uh, this next longer piece was written in the space between, oh, who of us can forget good old Hurricane Floyd, where we took about four feet of water in our house, uh, and many people sitting right here <coughs> took worse, okay? Uh, and between Hurricane Floyd and my youngest son Michael's wedding, and it's called Throwing Stones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Down on one knee, the one that still hurts from the flood, my back bent under stiff, empty trumpet vines this cold spring afternoon. I think of ways to clean these stones, raked out from rough leavings that mark the place where the water stopped. I toss the stones gently, flipping them from gloved hands to rattle and scatter off the brick wall, shedding their crusts of silt, bark, and seed. 
the smell that's lingered for months in the ground under layers of wet leaves distracts me. And I think that once I love that smell, near creek banks and under bridges, when such strange septic odors still felt like freedom to me. I decide this is a bad job, sifting through flood waste, saving stones, looking for some gift my garden cannot give when I am startled by a random glancing thought. The wedding day is here, and even more surprised to feel a sudden burst of thanks rush through and over me, and so I stand, not so much to ease the pressure on my knee or escape this new flood, but as a sign of recognition. To see a boy become a man and marry such a woman <clears throat> is cause enough for worlds of gratitude, but mostly I am thankful and glad to have them in the substance of my life and for the greater gift they are to each other. Well, like the poet said, spring is here, can summer be far behind? I paraphrase that a little bit. <laughs> summer. The bearded heron at the pond's edge. No time for ducks. Afternoon clouds rise in the west, full of sun and thunder. distant night sounds. Tonight, the moon just listens. One of the common subjects in haiku, especially Japanese haiku, and in my haiku, is the moon. Uh, and you'll hear a few moon poems before we're done. Uh, they also like crows, and so do I. In fact, I left Corbin out in the car. I've got, I've got a little crow statue that I was going to bring is, you know, my, my, my good luck piece. Swallows sweep in, pull back. Surprised I'm here. At dusk, the sound of thunder, rising wind. Faster than it looks, black salamander under the broken pot. Speedy little things. They don't look speedy, right? No moon tonight. Only stars light the silence. This next one actually happened. And some of you have probably even witnessed this. Mockingbird and crow contend on a roof. Crow calls for backup. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes still open in the empty light. Late moon viewing. I did a little of that last night, by the way. Did you know we had a hunter's moon last night? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Halo. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Let's say it was late moon viewing. Oh, this is another one. Unbelievable, but it happened. Red Hawk. Alert on the fence rail. Crow edging closer. <laughs> Honestly. So there's, there's a pond behind the North Carolina Museum of Art with a little observation platform that goes out over the water. And I was walking out there one day, and there was this beautiful red-shouldered hawk sitting at the end of the rail. And probably 15 feet was this crow. <laughs> Finally, the hawk just got bored with this drama and flew off. <laughs> but it, it, it was cool. Some of you may remember that a few weeks back, uh, from mid-August through the first couple of weeks of September, I don't know about down here, but up in the Piedmont, we had a bit of hot weather and no rain. So this poem is written to commemorate that event. 
waiting for rain. The rain stopped falling weeks ago. The ground is dry and clouds of dust rise off the crackling gravel road every time a car comes by. Roadside weeds are bowed and dried vines hang off trunks of trees made up in a gray mask of late summer heat. Big yellow poplar leaves flutter down one by one through the fading green like background in a story I read once years ago in some other place on the same dry summer afternoon. I stopped to wonder, but can't recall the book or time or place as suddenly the silence breaks from the bottom by the creek. Someone's dog is barking after something rattling through the brush, maybe a deer, likely not our local fox disappearing this time of year to darker, cooler places deeper in the woods. The dog goes silent. Nothing stirs but three crows in a dry swale bobbing after food or some obscure amusement. The present afternoon descends again while clouds out of the south move up, suggesting rain or maybe just a different number. Hot, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Fall. Here they come. Crows flying low through foggy trees. Autumn morning. A hawk hanging in front of the sun. Feathers edged in fire. I told Dixon that I was really sorry he wasn't going to be here today because I couldn't wait to hear him guffaw. <laughs> because that poem was ripped right out of Dylan Thomas's over Sir John's Hill. But it actually happened. I mean, I really, you know, visually saw this and I thought, hey, somebody said, T.S. Eliot or some other worthy, that good poets borrow great poets steal outright. <laughs> so we, we have, I don't know, maybe, what, what's the level below borrow? Um, <laughs> hidden by clouds, it can't be seen, the rising moon. Flashing water marks the wind's path across the lake. Think about that. I drive back and forth across Jordan Lake probably three times a week. And Jordan Lake is not exactly famous for, you know, it's, it's surfing waves. Mm -hmm. So when the wind just lightly riffles the surface of the water and the sun is out, it flashes. And one pattern flashes here and another pattern flashes there. Oh, all right. <laughs> Here's one I think some of you can relate to. Right, Chris? <laughs> Yapping and hooting. Barred owls break through my sleep. Have you ever heard barred owls doing their little courting routine? They sound like dogs. You know, a couple of them will hoot, then the others will go, yap, 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 yap. and I, we have them right, right next to the bedroom window. Um, two gray deer, faint shadows moving in the dark trees. Crow, flapping hard to hold its perch on a broken branch. September dusk, a harvest moon rising over the trees. Deep into fall, on leafless vines, some blue morning glories. I could have written this one this morning. <laughs> Outside the window, above the trees, a haloed moon. Mm -hmm. Except I actually had to go out on the porch to check this one out because it wasn't <laughs> in the right place. So, people ask me, what's it like to be retired? <laughs> and here, at least in part, 
is an answer to that question. This is a poem called Yard Work. <laughs> <laughs> a hard but necessary job pulling sharp iron tools through tough dead grass choked up between the green I worked to hold against a slope of stony clay that hides below. This thin shield of fertile soil and living rooted things is fragile armor against the dark autumn rains that fight to scrape the hillside down into the creek. The work makes joints and muscles ache, raises and opens blisters wet and raw on knuckles, palms, in spite of gloves, and urges me to push against all limits until I'm forced to break from the morning sun and rest below a ceiling fan behind a book of poems. But sweat drips down to sting my eyes, the wet shirt clings, there's soreness in the knees, but comfort in the silent woods. And all this makes me realize I am where I need to be, a place that I desired on ground I lean upon, humbled under trees and sky, rooted finally in this hard won peace. I think it was winter, right? Isn't that what Shelley said? Remember, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? Bluebirds scatter through branches wet with melting snow. I hear the sound of one hand clapping. Snowfall in the night woods. That, that is the go-to koan. And a koan is a, is a verbal, usually in the form of a riddle or a story, that Zen masters use to train their students in uh, non-linear thinking. So, how do you answer what is the sound of one hand clapping? If you live next to the woods and it's snowing, you know. February violets blooming near a house foundation. Think about that. I had to for a long time. Yeah, there's warmth coming through the bricks. Cold afternoon, low in the west, the moon just barely seen. Old Garden Buddha, up to its frozen neck in last night's snow. A friend of mine out in Iowa who read the book, said that he detected a note of irreverence in my poetry. Now, where in the world did he get that? <laughs> At long last, the sun there in a pale sky behind thin clouds. Winter treetops turning copper in the morning sun. The moon throws clean black shadows over frosted grass. Early morning paper, I see the moon in all its phases. Too soon for spring, the chorus frogs don't know. Can't you just see those poor little things? freezing in the mud as <laughs> the temperature drops. Uh, can I see the picture? The hat was high-tech stuff. <laughs> Doug would be proud. <laughs> Probably would have done the same thing. Okay, uh, this is a, a hand-blown glass bottle that was displayed in an exhibition of art class at the Toledo Museum of Art back in 1969. Okay, Toledo has got 
one of the two foremost collections of art glass in the country. Uh, and it is called, really, Bottle Boogie. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I saw this bottle and I was just, I was really impressed. I was transfixed. I went home and I started a poem and I got through the first draft and I realized it was sort of a self-portrait. And then I set it aside and picked it up and set it aside. Anyway, for over 40 years I've been working on this thing off and on. I just recently added the last stanza. So what it is, is a, is a self-portrait in two parts. One of glass and one of rubber. Written over 40 years. It's called Vessels. One. This jug maintains a certainty in slant tracery, incised silver under crystal skin, stretched hot and thin across the tension of a curve. This jug of glass reflects the light off slender plate, kaleidoscoping fractured worlds as they come tumbling by. This jug contains a breath within its shell and holds it there till tension fails, the shell explodes, the held breath flying free. Two. The jug above lies opposite the child's balloon enveloping his all-inclusive wondering eye. He absently releases it to float away a shadow fading in the light. And no, it is not about death. Though you can read anything into a poem that you want, okay? But a friend of mine, a poet friend of mine said, oh, what a great poem about death. And I said, yeah, except you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it has to do, I guess, this is as far as I'm going to go, and I, I normally don't explain, but it has to do with, with how our, 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 our spirit is enclosed mostly in our mind. And as an adult, you know, you think that that shell is just really, but a kid, eh, what are the two things you want to do with a balloon? One, you want to go pop. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, if it's helium filled, you want to let it go and watch it. Better to be a kid. Okay. More haiku? It really, if, if, if. you can stop me. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> Small beech trees, ghosts in the woods under a winter moon. A white fawn on dark green trees, summer tapestry. Deep in the trees, winter melts softly into shadows. Hard blue sky, one distant cloud floating above a thin stem of rain. <clears throat> Morning thunder, half moon fading over empty trees. Wind voices in the trees discuss deep emptiness. <coughs> no sound at dawn, just the silent turning of the starry wheel. This one's not quite as heavy. Mirrored bits of frost flashing in the grass, cold moonlit morning going out to get that paper. <laughs> Subtle shifts of gray, brown, green, 
the winter meadow. And at least as far as the haiku goes, we've got to go out with some class, okay? A white horse in a blue blanket pissing in a cold field. <laughs> <laughs> really? Driving down Pittsburgh Montreux Road, and that's horse and cattle country up there, by the way, in the central Piedmont. And I see this horse in a blue, you know, winter blanket, and I see this cloud of steam coming up, and I thought, why, of course! <laughs> My next haiku. <laughs> Thank you, Dobbin. Okay, so. How did a guy who took his undergraduate degree in English literature and wrote a lot of poetry and stuff, get to teaching history at Beaufort County Community College. Luck, the grace of God, well, probably both of those, but here's the skinny. <laughs> it's called the history teacher. For 30 years, I stood before them growing old, teaching history conceived as a grim, winking carousel, a dark, shadowed comedy, a bright, shining minstrelsy. Year after year, the students came and listened to the slant truths I had to tell, never knowing what it was that brought me here. Getting in front of the class to feed them leavings and scraps I'd gathered from a life that often seemed to me like aimless noodling through scattered facts and guesses I ran across and over, took lots of time in which I ruined relationships, suffered long sessions with solemn head shakers, and never stopped to read the manual for boys without a profitable goal in sight. Back then, I wanted to write a poem where black be recognized by women as sensitive, a true seeker after beauty. The woman who said that died young, stepped off a New York office tower. Now it seems I found what she never did, how to stay alive. I did the nimble dance, avoiding disasters, spent time learning the arts of commerce and war before I faced my fear that poems weren't real in the world where I needed to be taken for real. But history, my worthy second, for reasons I still don't understand, others took as real, even as a kind of science. And I was raised on science. I took the chance, made the choice, still young enough, went west, then east, finally landing on the Pamlico, entered the room, and faithfully taught a generation history. Yet secretly looked back, never forgetting what she said, never stopped looking for beauty very quietly, indulging my old lusts for truth and unreality, I wrote a poem. What do you think? Glad it's over. Right? <laughs>